All right. So welcome back to Mutations. I am joined today by my friend, Zach Stein. Zach, it's good to have you on. And Jeremy. Uh, hey. um, and yeah, so this is a conversation we've both been wanting to have together about uh, the dawn of everything by David Graeber and David Wengro. And as we were just talking, um, not only in our email correspondence, but just now, um, we both feel like we both have a lot to say, and we're both very curious about what the other's thoughts are on this book. And just as sort of a context, the um, our relatively local online integral community has been just exploding about this book. And uh, it's been kind of an interesting uh, progression since the summer with Nora Bateson uh, and her tweet or Facebook post about stage theory. And, and it's just been an endless conversation in our, in our circles. Um, and then this book gets dropped. And uh, Zach, I'm not sure. Were you were you familiar at all with with Graeber's work uh, before this book? I was actually, out, I think. yeah. I mean, as a educator, anthropology is one of the fields you have to pay attention to. And so I read in anthropology, discovered Graeber when he wrote Debt, and then actually spent a lot of time reading almost all of his work. Um, his book Direct Action, which is an ethnography of the activist movement, <clears throat> that one. You know, like uh, activism, the world trade organization protests, the battle in Seattle and Quebec City and these things. He was there on the ground and did anthropological work. Um, fascinating. <laughs> so I'm a, I'm a Graeber fan. So when this came out, I was actually very excited and, and read it kind of uh, very quickly. Um, so yes, yeah, I'm familiar with his work and it's influenced me uh, quite a bit. Yeah, me too. I uh... I kind of got into Graeber around the same time with Debt, and uh, I had, I loved the, the, his little book, uh, Fragments of an Anarchist Anthropology, and and uh, that was very formative for me back when it came out, just in terms of framing things from this sort of anarchist perspective, um, but bringing together the anarchism and the anthropology, and then his involvement with the Occupy movement, um, again, very formative for my own kind of intellectual thinking and journey, um, and likewise, I, I had been following some of their early publications, uh, their collaborations, uh, they did something in 2017 uh, called How to Change the Course of Human History. And it's kind of a truncated prelude to this big book, mm -hmm. um, The Dawn of Everything. And um, a lot of the themes were in there. And and most recently, have have you caught this book too as well? Because I'm probably going to be bringing this in as well. And, and Graeber and Wengro do. Uh, uh, for for the dawn of everything, uh, additionally, but James C. Scott's work, uh, like seeing like a stage seeing like against a stage. the grain, it's an incredible yeah. book. Yeah. yeah. So so that's our the context. I guess we're both swimming in here, and mm -hmm. then we're also coming from a field, a community that's very interested in the evolution of consciousness and stages right. of cultural evolution and right. um, individual and collective psycho spiritual development. Right and. We're coming from different angles, um, but I have a sense that there's there's some complementarity here. I've just always felt that about about your work, um, and I, I've always appreciated how you brought some more nuance to the way that we use these kinds of tools. Talking about developmental theory, um, kind of caution cautionary usage, really kind of understanding and recognizing the 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 power that these tools have, and then also um, um, how exactly to put it. I'm thinking of your chat with um, what's his name, uh, um, Jim Jim Rutt, uh, talking about stages and and the kind of yep. how large can we how how large of a claim can we make about a human population or social population being at a certain level? Right. Um, so you brought a lot of nuance to this discussion before it was blowing up in our circles. Um, I don't know where I'm going with this in terms of a question, but that's more of the context here of like why yeah. I was very drawn to to having this chat. Yeah, no, I agree. And again, the as I was reading it, having read Wilbur and Gebser um, and other, you know, models of, and William Irwin Thompson, I think, is also someone we both share a fascination with his work. Uh, you know, <clears throat> the time falling bodies take the light goes over a lot of the same territory as, as Graeber, um, mm -hmm. as does like Up From Eden, but in very different ways. <laughs> yeah. uh, so there is definitely a lot of opportunity to speak. And those issues specifically of stage like models of sociocultural development Graeber takes on directly in some very interesting ways. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of shared context. So I'm curious where to. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, this this could be, you know, we could just dive into the 
the deep end, essentially. Um, essentially, you know, the book is saying there's a new history of, of uh, and, and I want to like layer like some caveats and let me know what you think in terms of like what you were drawing from the book, uh, The Dawn of Everything. Um, a lot of what they're doing is, is essentially writing, writing in a popular way, in an accessible way, the last few decades of anthropological and archaeological yeah. studies, right, that have already kind of upended this quietly within academia, and nobody really prescribes to this um, general way or history of how things have unfolded from particular stages of, of, of cultural, like, it's just and not something that's in vogue. In narrow places in the academy, like archaeology and... Yes, yeah, yes. Yeah, exactly. But for large spots, like, they demonstrate with Harare and Pinker, yeah. like, Pinker, they still yeah. buy this outdated story, which is from anthropology and archaeology, like, almost immediately post-war. Yes, yeah. yes. So so really, you know, just as a fun foundation of what they're drawing from, it's not really just Graver and Wangro right. shooting the shit and putting together a big theory and 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 take it or leave it. They're, they're trying to draw from, I think, what is already kind of an emerging and more complex history that has a, a consensus within archaeology, anthropology. And just yeah. trying to make that accessible and engage the public about it. Now they have other layers to that, right? They're, they take shots at Pinker, and mm -hmm. um, and they certainly do push back against a kind of neoliberal mm -hmm. framing of history, right? That things sort of had to unfold in this particular way. Um, but I, I kind of make that distinction because I think um, when we throw a book like this into the middle of the culture wars, uh, it's easy to dismiss the book based on their own kind of political positioning um, and some of the metaphysical and philosophical claims that they interpret from this evidence. But it's, there's, a, there's this other layer, which is a, a scientific consensus about, you know, the history being much more complex than we presumed it was. But yeah, so, so I guess I'm kind of giving a general framing and feel welcome yeah. to kind of jump in. And, and Yeah, no, and that's the question of what is the book? <clears throat> what is the argument I think is key? And you're right, it is an argument primarily grounded in archaeology and anthropology of the last two or three decades. But it's, a, I would say, a speculative meta-theoretical integration of that work, um, which is why it's so provocative, because they're putting it in terms and putting it in context with things that it implicates, meaning like if we tell human history in a different way, it implicates political philosophy almost more than anything, and a, a few other aspects like the nature of the state. Um, and where those things come from. Uh, so that's what was kind of exciting about it. You know, and it like um, Tainter's model of civilizational collapse, which is many people know, you know, he's an archeologist. <clears throat> it was in that book that I first encountered some of the stuff that Graeber was citing here, um, like the Mississippian civilization and that the, that the indigenous Americans encountered by the Europeans were the diasporatic remnants of this once massively crazy, huge city in the middle <laughs> of the country in the Mississippi River Valley. Um, and Tainter actually looks at the collapse of that civilization in his uh, famous book. So I'd encountered that and was like, oh, that's kind of interesting. And as a kid, I actually went to that site in East St. Louis because my family is from Missouri. So I knew of that site <clears throat> and it was anomalous. Like it didn't fit the idea that and they were back, it was all tribes and small bands of hunter gatherers. And, and then I'm as a kid, I'm experiencing is sitting on this massive mound, huge public architectural work, taking you know, hundreds of people or thousands of people many months. <laughs> and I was like, well, this is weird. These are definitely not <laughs> tribes. Um, and so it's that sense of them integrating the anomalous data, which the old paradigm wouldn't allow and trying to articulate something new. The question of whether that means that some of the ways we've thought about it before are simply wrong. I don't know. It's more complicated than that. <clears throat> right. Um, right. Right. Yeah. 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 And, and um, that's a that's a good example with the the Cahokian civilization, and um, they've they've brought up quite a bit. And there's been other research in in kind of wrenches in the in the chain past ten years or so. Let's say like Gobekli Tepe and okay, this is a sort of a monumental site developed by hunter foragers in the Neolithic. So mm -hmm. it sort of um, scrambles the way things are supposed to have gone, right? right. And I think so generally there- There were no cities and there was no agriculture right. that slowly emerged and we're always going, mm -hmm. 
or as this I know, there were huge cities way before we thought there were. And these cities were actually organized <clears throat> in a way, in some cases, without obvious bureaucratic and authority structures like kings. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And in other cases, with limited forms of power that look nothing like what we call a state. Right, right. And that's very much what they draw from with uh, James C. Scott's work, just talking about early agricultural societies, wh which essentially were more egalitarian to some degree, and um, sort of had this sort of play farming, right, where they would move between different forms of subsistence um, in a very kind of dynamic, interesting way that we wouldn't imagine to have happened, right, with no evidence of a modern state, essentially. Um, and this wasn't just a little transitory blip. This was thousands of years. This is, you know, if, if we were going by the kind of historiographical framing that popular history yeah. goes by, then we'd say this was a block of time, right? Yeah. So, so, so it's kind of an interesting... Um, yeah. Again, it, it subverts that kind of linearity or succession. It complicates it. Um, but I, I guess kind of turning towards our questions, right? right. Like, um, does integral theory or developmental theory or metamodernism need that kind of succession? Because the whole, the caveats we often hear in our community is, is um, well, it's not linear, right? There's all these dynamics and there's retrogrades and things can move back and forth or things are a spiral. But generally speaking, I think the kind of complexity articulated by uh, Graeber and Wengro in this text and the text they're referring to point to something a bit more than just a little bit extra nuance to mm -hmm. the way things unfold, but actually a different shape of history, right? Yep. So how, I don't know, I guess my question is how, how are you reckoning with that and, and how does that inform your own work or? It, it's so interesting, right? One of the most fascinating things about the book, as with um, William Orwin Thompson's work and, and, and even up from Eden, is contemplating like the deep history of human experience. Like we're not talking, when we say history, usually we think, at least we, when I say we, I mean like people get educated in America think like European history. <laughs> but we're talking, and then we're maybe the Greeks or something, but this is like tens of thousands of years before Christ. And then there's evidence three million years ago of stone tool usage by sapient creatures, right? So we're talking about huge swaths of time. Uh, and so, you know, Goltepe, uh, Tempe, I think is how you say it. The my dyslexia makes this hard to pronounce those words, but that's, you know, 9,000 years or something before Christ. Um, so that this notion that uh, huge swaths of history were characterized just by these simple forms of political organization and that the simple forms of political organization were adopted unreflectively as a matter of necessity and circumstance that's being contradicted. Like the swapping between different forms of political organization in different seasons of the year, moving from an egalitarian thing when you're doing a kind of farming and then into a more top-down hierarchy when you're doing a kind of hunting and knowing you're gonna do that every year. And the archeological evidence shows that people did this for long periods of time. You see that that's a, they have to then, if you're just imagining them not as monkeys, but as people, <laughs> with an anatomically basically identical nervous systems, right? Uh, then they're reflecting on their political experiences and making conscious choices about their political uh, self-determination. Um, and that's a way of, so what Graeber's doing in the realm of political thought for ancient humans is what Wilbur and William Byrne Thompson and others tried to do for religious thought of ancient humans, which is to say that, oh no, we've been human for a long time. <laughs> and just because we, we were undeveloped on some lines doesn't mean that we didn't have access to, in Ken's words, you know, psychic, uh, subtle, causal experiences and the downloads from those and the ancient religions uh, being valuable, invaluable. <laughs> and Graeber saying, yes, yeah, similarly, just like if we want to take the ancients seriously as uh, spiritual uh, initiates and giving us insight, which we do, which is what it means to take something like Native American culture seriously or ancient Tibetan culture or Chinese culture religiously, spiritually. Um, <clears throat> then we're giving to so-called primitive humans uh, the full richness of human experience that we have. <laughs> and and Gebser's saying that too. He's talk, He talks about mutations of consciousness, not necessarily more and more and more and better and better and better consciousness. Um, so yeah, so there's something interesting that's being stated, which I think does point out in places like integral theory, where you have ideology 
<clears throat> masquerading as reflective theorizing. And by ideology, I mean uh, a form of thought that kind of justifies certain existing identity structures and forms of social organization, which we tend to do because we get basically like Stockholm syndrome with the institutions that we're hanging out with. And so we start to say, well, they're not that bad. <laughs> and Graeber's giving evidence. And as he's saying, the Native Americans did that we encountered to the Europeans evidence that, well, no, it's actually pretty bad, guys. <laughs> like there are other ways of living. And we know that because we have a, for a long time been making self-conscious political choices, which is David Graeber's, the whole point of the book is that it's about freedom. And it's about how do we create societies where we have reflective awareness of our political choices. Um, and uh, yeah, so that was a little bit of an answer to that. I don't think he's not a developmentalist though. I think he's actually giving us the equipment to do more detailed, almost psychographic forms of archeological and sociological <clears throat> analyses with his different, which is with his triplet for different forms of power and different forms of freedom. You can kind of see how there's, that's kind of the evolving pieces of different social systems. Um, so that there's probably more to say there, but I just want to put that out there, which is that. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, that's oh, where cool. I was wondering where you'd go, uh, and yeah. and you did go there. Um, kind of that 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 the book is not, and, and the work as a general collaboration is interesting too. Just that it's a transdisciplinary work between different fields, right? So this is kind of a move in that sort of integrative direction of allowing different fields that are highly specialized, but are very interesting things to say about very big swaths of time and history and politics and our origins, putting them in dialogue with each other and, and making a transdisciplinary work, right? And then from that, as you're saying, kind of drawing a sort of meta um, a theoretical image of the human being, which in some sense is aligned very much, and this is what I've been floating with my, my community, in some ways, there's a kind of alignment with the human potential movement here in the sense that, I mean, the image of the human you get from this book is that we are highly creative, right? We don't have to go a particular route. There are different ways to respond to different conditions. And there, these three primordial freedoms really kind of, you know, are at the foundation of that. But it, the image of us is it ends up being a highly plastic dynamic creative being that's in relationship with the planet and dynamically shifting and changing and capable of shifting and changing and remaking themselves. Right. So, so in some ways, it's a deep affirmation. It's a complexification of that kind of human potential movement aspiration, but it's, it's doing it from, from their own field there. So, so I kind of came to a similar sort of, you know, there's a lot of ways actually where the integral and the human potential movement and what Graeber's doing here is actually in profound synergy. Um, so there's that, and, and like I, I like what you said about um, with Gepser and the mutations, um, and that that just to share as well. Um, that's really the direction I, I took it uh, when I had first been reading their work on this a few years ago with uh, how to change the course of human history. And with this book, I think they've really unpacked that very uh, distilled version of their of their wider research. But um, you know, with Gepser's model, that these are discontinuous leaps, right? Where they have a kind of complementarity or relational complementarity with one another, where there is a kind of historical sequence that unfolds, but that's almost secondary or tertiary to this nonlinearity, right? So, so it's kind of more important that, that the structures are all in relationship with one another, and they have a kind of complexity that's their own. Um, and they have a time of differentiation. And then the, the thing about the integral structure is really the question of, okay, where does um, the flowering of the whole show up just in terms of human beings. And I think for Gepser, he kind of saves that question of emergence or development for, for the integral structure. Like, can we bring the whole together? Can it come online and transparent? Um, and so the point of that is, is it, it seems to be the shape of history that Gepser is speaking to um, seems to be in alignment with what Graeber and Wenger are talking about with the shape of history being this way. But yeah. so anyway, yeah, history yeah, and the history of consciousness seem to be kind of synergetic there. I mean, I completely agree. It's two, like two or three fascinating points there. You know, there is an implicit theory of human nature here and throughout Graeber's work. Um, I think Graeber probably wouldn't like the idea of like that his work supports the human potential movement, but I agree. The human potential movement in its best, least commodified, most authentic form, right? Like 
Um, and that's true. He's, he's laying out a theory of human nature and, and kind of doing a very complex thing where he's saying there's our political theories of human nature, which are speculative, which are always based on our kind of like sense of what actually history was like some kind of facts about history. And he's saying, well, we know new facts about history. So we should dialectically relate those to our speculative theories about human nature and what it is. And as you're saying, the, the facts so-called <laughs> on the ground in archeology span and the reasonable things we have to speculate about what those humans must have been like to create those cities and those tools and those things does lead to a situation where there's way more forms of exploratory political experimentation and social experimentation um, and adaptability. Uh, and very importantly in Graeber's model, care. <clears throat> that even the things we come to understand as oppression are actually perversions or distortions of an instinct for care, which is very, very early demonstrated. I can't remember where it was, but there was an archeological finding, one of the earliest ones. And, the, and Graeber cites this and the, the human had a broken, femur had a broken like a massively broken femur <laughs> and had recovered from it <clears throat> now what that tells us is that these so-called primitives were actually careful enough and full of enough concern to care for someone for months and months and months and months like six to nine months it takes to recover from a broken femur um uh you, you just don't see that behavior in animals uh and then other cases where some of the most remarkable kind of ritual burials in you know deep time like tens of thousands of years before we were supposed to be doing anything like having ritual burials <laughs> they are people with unique genetic sometimes deformities like um which means that they were revered precisely because they stood out and needed special care and concern of the community so there's a whole bunch of things that he shows us about what humans have always been like which the kind of dominant model and he argues for mostly kind of weird political reasons, this dominant model has convinced us that, that no, that's not what humans are like. Humans are competitive, they're vicious. <laughs> uh, they always were destined to evolve towards a form of political organization like we now have, which is this combination of these three forms of power, which we used to actually work to keep separate. <clears throat> um, and so that's a very interesting story. Uh, and I think does bode well for those people who want to basically look beyond current mistaken notions of human nature and articulate much more potential that we could actually solve <laughs> the existential crises we're in because we're that kind of species who's who's done that and can be very adaptive and, and morph. And then, yeah, the transdisciplinarity and actually the point about the integral is so good because Graeber's book is actually an example of something like an integral production because what you're looking at is not in the Wilberian sense, but in the Gebsarian sense. Although all those people in ancient times had maybe amazing cities and all kinds of stuff, they didn't have the forms of scientific archaeology that we have that allowed them to reconstruct tens of thousands of years of prior history in a detailed way using collaboration with like tens of thousands of scientists across you know decades of time. Right? They didn't have that apparatus in place. Um, so even though there's the morphing of consciousness, and in a sense, we were always human, there are these processes of embedded cultural ratcheting, which Tomasello talks about, which end up getting us in a position to be able to then look way back in time, very accurately and reconstruct for ourselves who we've been. And that's the kind of moment, and Ken notes this and Thompson notes this and others like, and Tilliard and the Russian cosmists who inspired him, <laughs> right? That like, this is a, this is a moment when we, whoa, and it, it wasn't possible before. And I don't think it, Graeber couldn't deny that. Um, so there's, yeah, there is something about the, the forward looking allowances of that retelling of history. That's completely, I think, necessary. It doesn't lock us in to this like dystopian way of thinking about the future. Um, and that's why some people would argue that, well, Graeber's politically motivated is a leftist. <laughs> like the book is woke and it's basically trying to, you know, yeah. overthrow the patriarchy and capitalism and all of this stuff. And uh, fair enough. <laughs> fair enough, yeah. yeah but um, spending the time to read it would be an interesting experiment for someone who tried to dismiss it so flippantly. Uh, yeah. 
And it's also worth saying that like Graeber is kind of the best, I think, of what the left has had to offer in a long time. And his critiques of simple notions of equality and diversity and things of that nature, like go right to the heart <laughs> of some of what's wrong with the extreme left and, and wokeism or whatever you want to call it. So yeah, so it's, it's rich text. Yeah. Definitely. Um, yeah, there's a lot, a lot to explore there. I, I think one of the things I'm, I'm picking up on is this sense that um, the 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 history of consciousness and therefore the future uh, obviously they're intertwined for for the two of them and and graber has been saying that from i don't know since i don't know always i've, I've always heard him iterate this in some way or another even in fragments of, of an anarchist anthropology the idea of, of knocking down walls between the past and the future right or the, the past and the present allows us to imagine different futures and and he also seems to have a grasp that um uh, the, the most successful anyway, if we're talking about revolutions or, or the left, the most successful ones seem to be able to bring together um, tradition and social transformation, right? They, they successfully recombine them and he often brings up the Zapatista as, as one of these examples. Um, and and that, that to really just sort of exemplify what he's illustrating again and again in the text, which is this really creative a novel recombination of what we assume to be um, striations of, okay, we're gonna, you know, this is traditional, then we have modern, then we have postmodern. And here we have many different cultures exemplifying a dynamic fluidity, combining them in ways that we didn't expect and moving in and out or up and down um, our own framing of these, of these particular social forms of organization or political organization. Um, and in some ways, so, so for me, like one of the things that I've been thinking about with this text and the evidence they point to is, is not so much that Gebser was incorrect. If the general shape of the mutational model is in resonance with what they're talking about, then I think we just need to, in some ways, take Gebser further, right? Like, you know, there was no period of only magical structure predominantly, you know, the, the mental was really much more in there than we realize, right? And so that, that goes to more to Graeber's point about humans have been these dynamic beings with all of these things available, realizing them in very complex ways. Um, and as you said, the, 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 the question then becomes, how do we fold in that, that um, ratcheting, right? How do we, what is a better language for that ratcheting or for that historical process of, as they frame in, in the book, getting stuck? And that's been the, the one thing that I think um, they've received the most flack for framing as like, we were dynamically moving in and out of these different social forms of political organization throughout all of history. So why did we stop doing that? Why did civilization take hold? And mm -hmm. that's always been the linchpin for, well, there must be a reason, therefore we can throw out their, their model because they can't explain that. Um, or it's, it's been, it's been a kind of, especially for integralists, I think, uh, a frustration. Like, well, what's the big picture, right? Where are we going? Why did this all happen? Is this just a matter of being stuck or is there something else going on here? So I wonder. Yeah, uh, it's interesting. And it's counterintuitive to think of the society that has done what it has done for the past 400 years with the planet as being stuck because we left the planet, <laughs> right? So it's, it's a weird case where we've been stuck politically and in some ways, at least lately regressing culturally and intellectually in some ways in other areas we are obviously really moving and that's where you can see these ratcheting effects i think take place if you do micro developmental analyses of shorter durations of social time basically so like if you look at nasa during the 50s or something <laughs> and look at their operations, you're gonna see a ratcheting effect of scientific technologies eventually leading to putting a man on the moon. And that's clear in terms of organizational development, scientific development, cultural development of that group of people at that time. So you can do that easily. You can do micro development analysis, I believe. And you could even do it enriched with Graeber's models of, of power and, and freedom. The problem sets in when you start to look at these massively long stretches of time. Uh, and when you fail in your imagination with regards to empathetically putting yourself in the position of the ancient person, which is where Graeber, you can tell there's like a, he's angry at the hubris and the kind of myopic view that has dominated anthropology since its inception. Um, and so he's always railed against that and actually from his earliest work shown that 
as anthropologists, it's our, it's our job to, you know, not bring so much <laughs> uh, in our interpretation. Uh, and so, so that's worth noting is that the, it's possible to look at sociocultural development, I think in detail in specific cases. So like, if you look at since, let's say the 1900s or late 1800s in Northern Europe, you could probably see something like a complex as Habermas did, he looked at the constitutions since the middle ages and applied Kohlbergian analysis to those constitutions and showed like, okay, in this narrow stretch, we can see a move from pre-modern to modern to something like post-modern and then maybe something like meta-modern now, but that doesn't mean the entire planet <laughs> simultaneously went through those three levels. That's a micro analysis, right? So, so that's where I think I take the very similar view to these issues as I do in, in individual development, like, which is to say individual humans don't move through lockstep sequences of development. <laughs> uh, and so it's, it's like we've got the models wrong in both the ontogeny and the phylogeny. Uh, both of them need to become much more complex and dynamical. Um, both the ups and downs and regressions and progressions, but also the multiple strands of development that can develop asynchronously, which is what we're looking at now. We're looking at crazy runaway technology development. Like if you look at just like science and engineering, humans are killing it. Now, if you look at like ethical thought and moral development and other things, recently we've been starting to get a little scary in those domains, <laughs> in part because of the asymmetry between the technology and its ability to dysregulate the life world and our education can't catch up. Um, so, so yeah, in a sense we appear stuck, but actually it's a weird pathological evolution that we are, we're stuck in a pattern. We're not stuck, like we're not developing, we're developing, we're just in an unhealthy pattern. <laughs> so we're gonna keep building rocket ships and missiles and social media and that's gonna keep developing, but we're socially, we can't accommodate it. And so we're becoming, unhealthy now this is me speculative <laughs> applying my meta my, my meta psychology to sociocultural development but it's me also kind of prompting those people who would be critical of graver because it complexifies a simple stage model I'm like yeah you you should complexify the simple stage models they're like doorways into a very complex way of modeling uh you know a really complex domain ultimately mm -hmm. yeah yeah i think i'm very much in agreement with um with you're speculating here, uh, and, and I've, I've kind of come to a similar uh, framing for this question of did we get stuck or how did we get stuck? And it, it's it's really, as you said, it's really not so much that. I think the the mutational model at least assists with with um, having a sufficiently enough stretched imagination to consider that this may be one path of mm -hmm. hyper complexification in one cer certain direction or one structure, right? That's really overemphasized with this 10,000 year process of, um, I don't know, an evolutionary drift toward the mental structure of consciousness, as Gepser might say, it has very good um, abilities to kind of make those sorts of discernments and to distance ourselves from, or at least experience a distantiation from the world and go to the moon and create computers and uh, all do all the kind of wild stuff that modernity particularly has exemplified, but the whole historical processes of civilization allow for that kind of um, decoupling, right? That untethering. And there's a lot of things to be gained from that untethering. But I think as you're saying, um, uh, and this is sort of our meta civilizational crisis, it's really being aware that, okay, going in that runaway direction isn't going to work. And eventually there has to be an integration or um, um, I've been using the metaphor of the stretch in the fold uh, very much from, from Deleuze and Guattari's work about um, the fold or the superfold, and it gets into complex stuff. But but the image itself of almost like stretching us like dough and differentiating us with one particular emphasis, right? Um, you don't want to keep going in that direction, or eventually you kind of you, you tear apart, you fragment eventually. Um, so so there's this co complex process of reintegration that I think we're we're dealing with here. So for me, my framing is I don't disagree with them about as you're saying getting stuck into one particular. Um, center of gravity, the mental structure or political organization that Graeber and Wengro talk about, it's, it's, um, that has afforded us certain capacities mm -hmm. that now need to be integrated and put, brought back into relationship with the whole. And uh, a history like this really helps us become aware there's all of these other 
these other potential political and social realities human beings have done. And as you know, our, our field looks at with uh, the history of consciousness, it's the same thing. There's all of these different structures that have been um, historically material, materially realized in one fashion or another. And there's things are much more pluralistic and much more complex. So, so how do we do that? And that, that's sort of my question, right? Like kind of reframing the stuckness as a, um, not being stuck so much as having a particularly long season in the seasonal dualism where we all got together and we really just kind of stuck with building the uh, monumental centers and the coercive state political organization. And it's been a 10,000 year season. And so what, what comes after, right? And I think that, that, that question is, is kind of what everyone's struggling with. Um, yeah, I know that it's very interesting. I mean, if I can continue to speculate and do the ontogeny phylogeny thing, I mean, if, if you think about individual development, one of the ways to kind of describe someone in a, who's an adult, who's kind of gone neurotic and a little pathological is that they got stuck, they're stuck. <laughs> uh, and it's often the case when you look at those individuals that there were times when they weren't, when they were actually chronologically prior in a better situation than they are chronologically later, even though many new skills have been developed and other things. And people think often this way about that's what happens when you grow up. <laughs> you actually lose a whole bunch of stuff you may have done and move into one fixed pattern, which may or may not be that good for you, but it's this pattern that you end up in, you're an adult, right? And so in a similar way that you can imagine, oh, a kind of like, uh, you know, you didn't self-actualize, uh, you kind of hypertrophied a couple skills that allowed you to make money and now you're stuck in a neurotic bad pattern. Like it's kind of the way I would look at <laughs> the way the civilization has gone that yes, like we lost a lot of these things that we used to really, really, really value as people, the three forms of freedom Graver speaks to. And we started to really overvalue some other things. And it didn't mean we stopped developing, but it meant that we got into a certain kind of negative looping neurotic structure, which now feels stuck, even though we're doing a lot of stuff and making all of this quote unquote progress in technology specifically, uh, there's still something that feels stuck and almost dangerously stuck in irrational habits. Um, and so it's important that the, the models of like integral theory don't stop us from being diagnostic and critical of the contemporary moment. And it is one of a kind of failure of the political imagination uh, and a kind of stuckness and a, and a dysfunctional kind of deep structure to the core of some of what's happening in the life world. Um, and so Graver is trying to really point at that kind of the way we would with someone who was going through therapy, like, don't you remember when you used to be like this and you valued all these different things <laughs> and at different times of year, you'd be flexible. And, and so I think, so there's a little bit of that and that's kind of just laying a slightly different metaphor, which is that, you know, in what ways do models like spiral dynamics and others explain sociopathy, right? It's a very important question. Is it just a regression to red or whatever you want to call it? Um, no, it can't be, right? Sociopathy is actually, in the way we see it in CEOs and politicians, it's actually a very complex structure, uh, which is the result of a lot of evolution and development of consciousness down a certain pathological uh, neurotic looping structure that becomes deep. Um, uh, and so we have to be able to apply that same kind of thinking to broad sociocultural development. Uh, you know, Ken's book, The Eye of Spirit, it's, you know, for a world gone slightly mad. <laughs> it's not for a world where everything's going great and we've evolved towards, you know, goodness the whole way. <laughs> it's, no, we've kind of gone a little mad here. Um, and Graeber and them, and, and, and Weingraber are saying something similar, like, you know, we can see what we've been doing in the shadows of our history, but we've never done it like this. <laughs> like there's been forms of this and forms of that, this form of authority, this control of violence, control of charisma and information that we've mixed with different forms of power, but we've never centralized them like this with this kind of ambition, with this kind of um, long-term comfortability with oppression and hierarchy. Um, mm -hmm that we did a lot of aggression and hierarchy, <laughs> but it was always, you know, in the mix with other things and, and uh, often was wiped away and off the map, like that central Mississippian 
civilizational complex. Uh, I believe Graver reported that, you know, once that decomposed and that they wouldn't go back <laughs> to yeah. that part of the world. They're like, no, we just don't walk through that part of the world anymore because we don't want to remember how bad it was. Um, and so, yeah, there's something, there is a revolutionary calling Graver's book as there has been in all of his work. Um, and uh, that kind of call for like very serious political change uh, requires a completely different form of political imagination. And so it's, it's deeply metapolitical, as I would say. Yeah, yeah, definitely in agreement. I um, the, the other example that comes to mind is the Teotihuacan um, in, in, Meso, in, in Mexico, modern day Mexico, where uh, the, basically they overthrew a very hierarchically stratified society where there was human, human sacrifice, et cetera, et cetera. Anyway, they, they took over the nobles buildings and created a kind of um, egalitarian society where everybody got to enjoy the sort of public commons for for a time before abandoning the site altogether right, right. so there's these yeah. all these interesting examples of kind of being able to as as you talk, as i talk about with the three freedoms to disobey to go somewhere else or, or to create a new social arrangement and yeah. I, I love this idea because there's um i would love to hear your thoughts on this too from from your own framing but there's um, with the three freedoms, right, and with this image of human beings as, as highly plasticistic and capable of reshaping their social arrangements in them, themselves, uh, there is also this sense of um, a kind of primordial or originary freedom or a kind of spiritual freedom, right? And, and so I, I couldn't help but start to make those totally. connections with Gepser and origin and Gepser's language for origin is, is always, you know, freedom, plenum, creativity, right. openness, right. transparency, right. Um, the fluidity to move in between all right. these different structures, right? So there is there is something there. And I was wondering what- There is, no, it's interesting. Yeah. The three freedoms are something like the freedom to move through space so you can go where you wanna go, the freedom to disobey orders and the freedom to experiment with different social forms, the, the three freedoms. Uh, and the argument would be that we're stuck because we're starting to drastically lack in those freedoms. <laughs> um, when, for example, the indigenous Americans we encountered were very high in those freedoms, um, right? And so when you set the switches that way, then yeah, <laughs> you know, they have to, they have to look at it in that sense. But what you're getting at is Graber's, as I said, there's an implicit, uh, as all anthropology has, an implicit theory of human nature. And it is one that is basically anarchist, that is postulating not an inherent goodness. I don't think it's that. Um, but it is something like a freedom, uh, primordial freedom, I think is a good word. Um, uh, and understanding and valuing that, and then some kind of empathy that makes you value freedom in the other. And then that's where you start to get a whole bunch of complex um, arrangements that value freedom, and which is what Graeber is trying to say, we need to begin to experiment with again uh, and it's interesting you note that like the three forms of power which are violence information and charisma or sovereignty bureaucracy and competitive politics that those are instituted at various places in history as an attempt to basically secure greater freedom and then once they're locked in for too long they start to distort themselves and then they're you know, making freedom harder to get, and then they get overthrown, and another constellation of those three forms of power sets in. That's a very interesting model, um, and it allows for those kinds of micro developmental analyses over short historical time periods. And then you have to look at how long a particular civilizational technology stack lasts, and how much ratcheting occurs, <laughs> um, and how much cumulative history they're recalling scientifically. And that's where you do start to see that, oh, our planetary civilization is distinct in quality and kind, even though we can look back at its history and see other times when it was like interestingly different <laughs> than it is now uh, and interestingly differently potentiated, meaning we didn't have to end up here, which is what Graeber's trying to say. Um, so that I think is a, a wrinkle in there, which is that, yeah, since he's not saying it was better back then, it's not what he's saying, <laughs> or that somehow we need to go back there uh, or that this thing we have now we've seen before He's not denying any of that. Uh, if anything, he's saying there's an urgency because of the size and scale and, and of our current civilization, an urgency to open up more freedom, especially in those realms of political experimentation. Um, uh, 
which fits, of course, with uh, all of his, his anthropological work and activist work, right? Yeah, there's two themes there. Uh, one is, again, that convergence uh, with, with some of Gebster's work in, in approaching this as um, you know, part of Gebster's diagnosis of the mental structure in the 20th century, isn't it? It's, it's not a bad thing to have the mental structure. It's just been overemphasized, right? So there's this fixation, right. which, is, which compounds and, and creates this crisis and creates this kind of runaway relationship with technology or capital or time, you know, in the kind of metaphysical sense he goes into. So, so again, it touches on those freedoms, right? The ability to, to move, to shift, to reshape our political organization. I think for Gepser would be, you know, the spiritual freedom in terms of the consciousness structures is the capacity to move in and out of, of any of the particular structures and dynamically as needed, right? Like so we don't need to um, uh, fixate and rigidify around a particular around the mental or the mythical or the magic. It's usually bad news when that happens in, right. in his model. Um, so, so there's this affirmation of freedom and, and um, fluidity or openness. Uh, but then when we go into um, some of what he talked about with uh, the sort of political implications, it's it's kind of the same thing. Well, what happens if we engage in a different social arrangement or a different mode of time? Um, a time that's able to slow down or reverse. I mean, that's dramatically um, of, right. of import for us and the whole way we've arranged our society to be able to slow down is catastrophic as we've been mm -hmm. learning from, um, from COVID for the way we need to keep, right. you know, going faster and making more money every year. I mean, there's a whole, you know, what we are talking about with this runaway tech, runaway economics. Um, so, so there's a dramatic and, and fairly radical um, claim in there, even with Gepser just, yeah, we need to re reshape our entire social arrangement, our forms of time, right? The whole way we've set up the society is really overemphasizing something. So, so yeah, there, there's, a, there's a political implication in this. Um, and there's also a kind of correspondence with what you're saying, with, um, as I was saying, the kind of reification of any one structure creates this sort of mm. not being in a good place, right? Um, creating these kinds of problems. So, I don't know, I think I'm coming, kind of coming around to uh, the, in the present, right? Like thinking through this, Graeber and Wengro kind of leave us with that. Mm. Okay, mm. these three freedoms and we need to kind of think about um, how the past can also kind of open up new futures. Um, but how exactly can we, can we play with these? And what, what are the pathways to um, actually engaging these freedoms socially again, right? Or uh, again, by analog, Gepser, the mutations, right? The different structures. What what allows for this? How do we use this or, or work with this to uh, help us through this meta crisis? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting, right? Because what Graeber is doing, and we haven't talked about it yet, so it's coming up now, which is that he's the book started as trying to explore what's the origin of inequality, right? And throughout the book, they're kind of saying that's not a great question. And in fact, when we look at the things we value in societies and we look at the metrics we want to use to gauge like kind of how good or bad a society is these three freedoms which he posits as that are not it's not the language we're currently using <laughs> to describe the things we value in our society um, which are uh different you know it, the, the conversation around equality being one of them so if you embrace the three freedoms it doesn't necessarily mean you get simplistic forms of Equality doesn't even mean you get peace, <laughs> uh, which is one of his points. Like you know, your point about this whole thing needs to shift. It's so overemphasized. The good news is the historical record shows we have corrected that mistake before. <laughs> it's just been on a limited geographical scale, you know. Um, and so I think one of the first steps is to go metapolitical, like Graeber has done, and look at the languages and grammars that we use in the context of politics currently, and source them to the, their root in these particular often unexpressed theories of human nature and human history. Um, so one step, and this is the invitation Graver's basically, I think, making to the left in particular is to like, guys, <laughs> like there's very something serious about what you're saying here, but we need to find a different way to conceptualize, to speak about it, and then to enact it, right? Like enacting freedom is different than enforcing equality, for example. Um, uh, and doesn't mean equality is bad, right? But it does mean that 
what you would do to say we value freedom fundamentally these three forms specifically um, becomes interesting and his other point is that the deliberateness with which we think about the political uh, and this goes with reflecting on the metapolitical we just need more deliberateness with how we think about the political um, like I don't know if you've watched many town hall meetings or like city council meetings or school board meetings, but they're a mess. <laughs> like they're a complete mess. And rarely is someone thematizing the lack of political imagination that allows this meeting to continue to just be a, a complete mess when there's like dozens of better decision making processes <laughs> and group dynamic processes and depolarization processes and other things that could be brought in there. In, the interest of political experimentation to try to solve problems together but instead we just stick with this demonstrably dysfunctional and now in bad faith kind of like um charade of politics and so he's trying to deepen our seriousness about the political and show that you know what's at stake here is the way we think about the nature of the human um, and so he's exposing kind of the the anti-humanism that's at the source of some of the dysfunction of our political culture, that we're actually cynical about ourselves, that we don't trust one another, that we think we were basically destined to be doomed and we have to like control the unreasonable masses and somehow make out for ourselves in what time is left, <laughs> you know? Uh, and he's like, no, that's a sign that you guys are about to get overthrown <laughs> by the masses who still value these three freedoms. Uh, and have been willing in historical time to put everything on the line in their interest. Um, so I think that's the that's the thing that I would say. And of course, but I'm an intellectual and I'm not an activist, you know. Um, uh, so I don't know politically in terms of people who are looking at specific issues and kind of doing specific projects. I'm not sure how to give specific advice. What I'm saying is very general, <laughs> and in a sense, an invitation to philosophy. It's what Graeber's offering um in a time of crisis that's actually what's necessary so i tried to express with my political metapolitical work um, we can't even go into that language that's being spoken we can't even say what needs to be said in so much of what is political discourse quote unquote political discourse <laughs> uh, and so graber is trying to give us a more serious language to use i think in those contexts yeah yeah that's that's um definitely a good a good answer for for you know what what are the implications when we close this book? What do we, you know, what is he, what tools are left for us to begin to um, either utilize or, or reflect on? And in many ways, as you're saying, the examples of the, the ample examples of all these different modes of revolution and reshaping society that are, when they become, I mean, there's a kind of um, transparency of history here, right? Like where we see it in this much more complex way and and less linear and we're aware of the presence of myth as we shape and reshape these histories um these new possibilities do open up and and that i think is the key uh open-ended process he seems to be suggesting which is plasticity play creativity trying something and being able to to drop it if it doesn't work mm -hmm. right now for the meta crisis or for the civilizational uh, transformation we're undergoing more than ever, you know, that image of the human being as, as this sort of highly plasticistic, um, playful uh, uh, species is, is more important than ever, right? There's this kind of dynamic mutual learning process, as, as, as Nora Bateson might frame it, that has to be, um, not has to be, but you know, like it's, it's, it's inviting us to be more like, you right. know, the yeah. history that he's, yeah. he's, he's Totally. Demonstrating here. Mm. Yeah, um, I mean, <laughs> not to close on this note, but he's also demonstrating history of, of violence, you know, and demonstrating history of sacred ritual violence in response to oppression <laughs> and other things. And so there's also a, a warning in the book as well um, about just how kind of complex history has been and the gruesomeness of some of what humans have had to endure um, and and so I think there's uh, you know it's it's fascinating to see the book come out when it's coming out and it's remarkable that Graeber passed away actually before it was was published um, because it it does feel like an important attempt to make a key move in the culture <laughs> around 
some of the, like I said, some of these, these languages that now dominate the discourse um, that he's inviting us again to look at freedom. Um, for example, the relation between freedom and security, right, is one of the things that the state is involved with. It's like, how do we balance things? <laughs> um, and so, and then I think that the final note, which you kind of sounded was that, you know, there is a certain inherent creativity in the sense that violence is an instance of that, uh, which allows human societies to reshape themselves. Um, and so, yeah, the question of what that looks like uh, and how each of us individually respond, I think is so complex. Um, and so, yeah, I'm with you and thinking about once you close the book, kind of the now what is, is interesting. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, just to um, wrap it up with a few, a few, few of these themes. Um, maybe the first uh, is that uh, I, I, this is something I've been talking about. I mean, our communities are all very interested in all sorts of form, forms of social experimentation, blockchain and um, mm -hmm. the sort of technological uh, socialisms that have been played around with, especially like blockchain socialists is talking about this. And Kim Stanley Robinson has been sort of playing around with these different possibilities for how we can kind of bridge um, to a post-capitalist biosphere eccentric future. Um, but it, it certainly does seem when we close the book that all of these themes uh, are laid out to kind of say, hey, you know, uh, we are capable of social experimentation. So let's embody that and lean into that a little bit more. In a time where we're probably not going to know that we're going to make mistakes, and it's a critical time, you know, and, and unfortunately, we're going to make mistakes in terms of um, learning the path through this right now. Um, and figuring out, quote unquote, what's in the next season will require us to probably try a few different things and be dynamically shifting. And, and I, I feel or sense there's an analog here, Wilbur is saying about this kind of like, you know, dynamic, all the, all the stages of consciousness available, but also with Gepser particularly, and how he talks about um, the plenum of this sort of bringing forward the integral originary presence to, to be sufficiently responsive enough to this crisis. To, to, you know, be creative or productive or help us through it. Um, and then even McLuhan talking about this, um, how he uses uh, the Joycean colloidoscope image of the whole history of communication mediums, almost like dynamically moving or morphing. Um, there's this kind of image of the human being as, as, as again, uh, reacquiring that fluidity or plasticity. Um, and where am I going with this other than to say, I think, um, uh, it, it seems to be the general orientation of the aperspectival turn, which is how do we bring all that history and, and render it present and really hold it with that kind of, kind of complexity? And then how do we embody it? Um, but then ultimately, uh, how exactly to, to frame it? Um, th there's, a, there's a material sense to all of it too. Right, like there seems to be this sort of orthogonal move that we're talking about, and everything we're saying here about um, grounding ourselves again, uh, coming back down from this long runaway period of differentiation. So for me, anyway, like I don't know, I just wanted to hear your thoughts on the sort of orientation towards kind of in the Latorian sense coming down to earth, right, or becoming terrestrial, and that there's a kind of organizing principle there that seems to be in resonance with. Um, Gepser, yeah. et cetera. Right. And well, and that's where the, like I've already mentioned, the <clears throat> Cosmos and, and Tilliard and the Orbindian models where you're looking at a long-term process of inevitable planetization of the species. And it's interesting, Graeber, although he talks about different sizes of different cities and communities, he doesn't talk about the obviously demonstrable increasingly large size of the capitalist world system as it eventually became the first planetary civilization, which doesn't have the luxury of collapsing and then rebooting from next to zero because we've got atomic bombs and, and other things that we just can't neglect for that long. Uh, and, and so I think that that's, it's not an omission in Graeber's point. And again, it's, it's more just like, a, it's so obvious that we're sitting on this massively complex thing. But it is worth noting, and I think 
as I mentioned before, um, we're not stuck. We're developing very quickly. Uh, some parts of us are stuck and we need to dislodge those parts and get them to catch up with the rest of, of, what's, a, of what's occurring. And so that notion of like a seasonal shift, um, I think is a useful one. Uh, instead of reading this like a massive mistake, it's kind of part of a developmental process that was a little bit more dialectical and there needs to be a re-emphasizing of things that have been lost or unemphasized. Um, and so what that means is that, you know, the history of novelty um, speaks in our favor because we're not looking backwards towards some prior way of solving this problem. No one's ever dealt with a planetary civilization before that couldn't collapse. <laughs> so, so that sense of finding ways to kind of like create those pockets of freedom uh, in the midst of securitizing what needs to be secured uh, and in the midst of those finding the seeds that allow the whole thing to then become restructured. Um, and so, yeah, it's that, it's that kind of, uh, it's that depth of thought that I think Graeber uh, is inviting us to, as I've said before. Um, so, yeah. Thank you, dude. This has been kind of what I, exactly what I want to lead into. Awesome, Zach. Yeah, yeah, this is great. We should definitely uh, continue it again sometime. Um, yeah, let, let maybe just let folks know, uh, you know, what you've been up to lately, maybe where they can touch base with you, uh, where your website is, et cetera. Totally, yeah. I mean, I, I read this because of my work with the Consilience Project, frankly, because, you know, we're looking at basic issues of civilization, civilizational redesign, civilizational collapse. And there's an implicit theory of human nature and of civilization in Graeber's model. Um, so yeah, my writing is with the Consilience Project. And then, yeah, my website, you just kind of Google my name and you'll find me. Great, fantastic. All right, let's let's uh, let's pick this up uh, yeah, sometime in the near future. But uh, I think there's a lot of, uh, the ground is very fecund for, for generative conversations about, you know, where does meta theory work go from here where does integral theory go from here so so I, I sense some creative collaborations in the near future so yeah. we'll be in touch yeah, yeah right really. right. thanks Zach